<laughs> All right. Uh, cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is our first uh, pre-recorded uh, edition of Walking the Talk here at Highwire Improv. Uh, so you get to see uh, what it looks like when we don't have uh, the transition from an improv show directly into a more serious discussion of uh, topics and ideas and thoughts uh, in the improv community. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this before, Walking the Talk is something we do uh, on a uh, aspirationally weekly basis. Uh, in practice, it's been some weeks, but not all. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're trying to have uh, conversations with uh, improv practitioners from across the world about some of the more tactical and specific things that people can do, try to make their improv communities or their theaters or their teams or even their own individual performance uh, more equitable, inclusive, uh, and just a better uh, in any way we can think of. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to be joined by two wonderful guests today. Uh, Tavish Forsyth and Stephen Davidson uh, from e each uh, with some, some interesting, interesting similarities. Uh, they're both instructors. They both have their own organizations in some form or fashion. Uh, and uh, that's really cool. Uh, and so uh, love for each of you to kind of introduce yourselves in, in your own words, and then we'll get to some, some topics of discussion. Um, so uh, why don't we start with you, Stephen? Sure. Uh, hi. From Impromiscuous. I'm based in London, UK, although I'm Canadian originally. Um, and I work a lot in diversity and inclusion. I've written two books about it. The first one is Play Like an Ally, the second is Improvising Gender. Uh, and I do workshops and trainings around that and more broadly around inclusion. Uh, I have a longer course on that to go yeah. talk with the fantastic Monica Gaga. Nice. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's me. I was very awkward introducing myself, so I'm gonna. <laughs> and I'm Tavish, Tavish Forsyth. My pronouns are he, his. I'm a queer improviser and educator based in Baltimore, Maryland. And I run a company called Bird City Improv. And I also work with Highwire Improv on the anti-racist, anti-oppression committee. Previously, I worked with the Baltimore Improv Group. And I'm an adjunct faculty member at Johns Hopkins University. I teach long form improv and I also teach applied improvisation, which is about taking the principles behind improv theater and improv comedy and trying to apply them to the everyday. And a fair chunk of that applied improvisation ends up talking about unconscious biases, uh, forms of oppression and how we can combat uh, unconscious biases and forms of oppression. Wonderful. Uh, honored to have uh, all of this expertise in one Zoom room. Uh, uh, really excited to talk with you, you both today. Um, I thought an interesting place to start would be, um, you know, uh, one of the things that we're seeing, at least in the last 10 months, is a lot of people are um, uh, adjusting maybe assumptions about how improv can be taught and, um, you know, the structures of improv organizations uh, overall. Uh, and there, there's a huge range of different possible ways to do that. Uh, one thing that I know that both of you have done, uh, which I hadn't seen really much at all before, is the idea of having uh, co-taught classes uh, where you have multiple instructors involved. Um, and I'm curious uh, from each of your points of view, you know, what motivated that? Uh, and you know, what benefits are you seeing from, from having a multi-teacher experience? Um, and how, how might people think about taking advantage of that in the future? Um, for me, I feel like co-teaching gets us closer to what improv is slash should be because mm -hmm. if it's a product of uh, all of the people in the group or in the room or on stage in a scene, uh, then it's inherently collaborative, right? And I think it's very hard to teach that without the example of two people working together to create what that is. Mm -hmm. in the um, I've also found that uh, it's a really nice opportunity just to share good practice with people who are more and less experienced than me, uh, because teaching all by yourself all the time can kind of feel like you're shouting into the void sometimes. It's a little bit lonely, even though you're always with people. Yeah. And for something like inclusion, I think it's really important to center lived experience. So that's a co-taught course, and we have multiple guest teachers just to make sure that people are speaking to their own experience. So I think that's important too. Yeah, I agree. 
I think having that component of a, another teacher that can speak to a broader range of experiences is really important. I also agree, like improv is a non-hierarchical art form, right? It's based in collaboration and that idea is kind of thrown in, it is contested a little bit just by the nature of like improv classes where it's non-hierarchical, but this teacher is telling you everything that you have to do all of the time and, and some perhaps a little bit more militantly than others. Uh, and in terms of teaching more, uh, I would say like most of the time I do end up solo teaching, but when I make the very intentional effort to co-teach, it is when the topic is going to be something that I know that I might have unconscious biases around, or I know that my lived experience might not be uh, enough to successfully facilitate the class. And of mm -hmm. course, I always say to the students, like, if I ever say something that you feel like is inaccurate, like, please speak up and let's have a conversation about it. I'm not here to be like a dictator in this classroom. I, I do believe that even though I'm leading it, uh, that this should be a collaborative effort. But I feel like those ideas are really reinforced by having another teacher there with you. Uh, so there's an upcoming class that I'm teaching with Bird City called Social Satire, which is going mm. to be about finding ways to uh, create more like political and social and, and cultural based comedy that's rooted in punching up and rooted in anti-oppression. And I really wanted to make sure that I co-taught that class. In fact, yeah. I refuse to teach it unless I have a co-teacher, especially at, at this point where it's a class that I've only taught uh, one other time in the past. And I realized like I'm always still learning. Like I do not feel confident enough in my knowledge base to successfully teach this class if an issue comes up that maybe I don't know as much about. Uh, so I'm making sure that I have a co-teacher for that class. That co-teacher is going to be Kim Scarf. Yeah. And uh, there's another class that I'm teaching right now called Improvising Change, Practicing Anti-Oppression, which is mm. about, um, it, it's about engaging in role play scenarios where we can have conversation around oppression and practice allyship. And I'm co-teaching that with a yoga teacher friend mm. of mine uh, who um, is also like very passionate about these topics. And I find that just by having that other voice in the room, it's it's super helpful to, um, to facilitate yeah. and, and uh, invite more conversation to the topics as well. Because even if like she and I like start talking a little bit, just by just by modeling that behavior of yeah. me and the other teacher are conversing about a topic, all of the sudden it is sort of like this gentle invitation for the other people in the classroom to also start having a conversation as well. Yeah, it feels important for inclusion to model uh, multiple people having input, but I feel like it also works a bit against the idea of sort of the guruization of great improv teachers, which mm. bugbear of mine. Yeah, and I feel like it sets up a hierarchy that's uh, kind of inherently problematic, particularly when we start thinking about the global improv scene. Um, yeah, and people who are very fancy in one country, sort of dictating what improv should be on the other side of the world. Yeah, I have strong feelings about that, and I feel like the more we model it as a collaborate art art form and one where you have to find your own voice, the less that's going to happen. Yeah, I, I just want to like add on to that because yeah, I love the guru. The How did you say it? The guru? Guruization. Guruization. <laughs> the guruization of, of improv teachers uh, and how it's sort of like a bugbear. I, I'm feeling very much the same way recently, especially yeah. about like Del Close. Like I mm. feel like in my soul, I just have like crosshairs on Del Close lately. Because the way that Del Close, for those that don't know, Del Close yeah. is um, one of the creators of long form improv, one of the creators of the Herald, the Deconstruction, the Armando, like all of these sort of important forms that are that are widely practiced in the United States and also making their way around the world. Uh, and the way that he's taught and the way that he's talked about in so many textbooks is as a guru. He literally has a biography called Guru. Uh, like his students, uh, you know, kind of like worshiped him and considered yeah. him like this metaphysician, spiritual leader, but he was super abusive. He was super abusive to his students. And right. he said sexist things, racist things, ableist things, and all of it is very well documented. And yeah. people just sort of tell these stories that like, wow, look how, 
Look how cuckoo Del Close was. Um, and no one, it, it was only recently that I even sort of like learned about like the depth of how abusive and how toxic mm. his classrooms were and started reading, hearing about these stories. And it was because like I decided to read two of his biographies and yeah. I was like, holy, wow. Uh, so yes, like we need, yeah. we need to get rid of that, um, well, it's, that, it's, that component of improv culture. Yeah, it's interesting because yeah, I've, I've, I think like many people come to similar realizations, uh, you know, more recently than I would have liked. Uh, and, you know, if you look at across everything, there's not really a guru type role that's ever gone well. Uh, and for some reason, the the types of you know activities that we participate in, we were blind to that, right? Which I guess is how, how the whole process works. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see like oh like you know there's this you know religious cult leader like oh they're obviously bad. Look at all the things they're doing, but don't recognize the pattern in the same types of behaviors that occur in the communities that we're involved in because you know that's that's how those power structures work. They're they're a lot harder to see from the inside. Um, and so, you know, really starting to question how we structure ourselves and structure our engagement, you know, I think is, is really helpful. And, and looking at other types of communities and, and organizations and the errors that they have or the, or the successes that they have and bringing those to, to improv is really good. Um, in particular, this concept you're both you know, kind of touching on around, um, you know, modeling non-hierarchical development and growth and instruction, right? Like that's for a lot of people, especially uh, in Western cultures, that's really, really hard to accept or understand that the teacher can also like seed control or seed, you know, um, you know, power. And like, I, I could absolutely see like getting a, a, a survey feedback form after a class. I mean, like the teacher wasn't teaching the whole time. What, what was going on? Like, why, why, why did I spend $200 for the teacher to sit there and listen to me? Um, and, right, but but in many ways that actually is modeling good improv um, to 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 listen to the other people and, and you know, people might not understand that. So um, I'm curious if that if you've ever had kind of resistance to some of those concepts of um, maybe a, a little bit more progressive structures for these classes or, or workshops. Not specifically in that sense. Yeah, I still get the feedback that I'm not harsh enough in my criticism. <laughs> that is a conscious pedagogical choice, so too yeah. bad. Um, I, I definitely feel like so many theaters and structures are modeled on that sort of top-down yeah. uh, structure that it's hard to get people to see that there are other options. Yeah. That mm -hmm. sense. Um, and I feel like also because improv is such an abstract Thing, particularly when you're first starting, you crave an authority figure to tell you how to do it correctly so that you can mm -hmm. feel all right about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we just need to keep constantly working all of these concepts into our classes at different levels. That's all. Yeah. Um, I, know, I know each of you have worked uh, in uh, what would be traditionally described as like a director role for projects as well. Um, I know, you know Tavish, you've worked as, as director of you know, scripted plays, for example, and, and Stephen, you've you know, produced and developed uh, a number of different improv shows and concepts. Um, how do you think about that that side of things? And um, you know, in, in the context of this this structure, you know, how how do you think about providing artistic guidance, but not being how do you not be a director, but not a dictator? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how have you thought about kind of that in, in the work that you've done? Two things stand out to me. One is something that a professor said to me in undergrad, which is uh, that a, a good director is not a dictator, but an editor of content. Mm. And so really introducing a, a playful improvisational spirit into the rehearsal room, even when working with scripted material, I think is really important for producing a quality play. Hmm. And, oh shoot, the other one, it just escaped me. Oh, and there's like in, in, in film, 
directorial theory. There's something called auteur theory uh -huh. which is oh. French for author. And it's all about like the director having like final and absolute say. And mm. in, it's a, also like a lens through which we can engage in film criticism by exclusively looking at the director's choices and, mm. and analyzing film through the director's vision. And it just really guruifies the director in a way that I, I totally um, reel back and disgust at. Uh, yeah. And I, I, when I start a rehearsal process, I, especially for a scripted thing, I start by sharing those two ideas and just like putting them out there that mm. like, I'm not special, this is not my play. I'm going to help make some choices and sort of like help sculpt it a little bit, but you give me the choices uh, mm. and I'm just going to work with whatever content you generate. Mm. Yeah, I, it's so interesting you ask that because I'm co-teaching a course on how to direct improv. Yeah. Very <laughs> Wilder. Um, and last night, one of the exercises was to have people offer ideas and practice saying yes or no or not now, but later because mm. uh, and how that sort of relates to your own plan. And I think I was interested to see how many people had a strong leaning to either say yes to everything or to say no to everything and mm. not find that here's what we're doing. So this fits and this doesn't kind of idea. To me, I feel like it's a bit it's like being in a position of care. Well, it is being in a position of care where, for example, if you're a teacher, you need to be able to set firm boundaries in some areas mm. uh, for the good of everyone in the room. And saying yes or no to things as a director feels really similar to that. Mm. Where it's in people's own interest to be seen and heard, and that's good for them. But it's not in their interest to have lots of conflicting ideas and or feel like they're in a car that nobody's driving. Uh, so I, yeah. I try to that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, that really resonates. Um, yeah, because I've read some articles uh, from the Austin community on directing improv, and they're not being like a, a major, at least in the US, like a huge culture of directing improv. It is you know, very much a coaching culture uh, mm -hmm. instead of directing culture. Um, and, you know, the driving without a car, uh, driving a car without, you know, how do you describe it? A, a car that's driving without a driver, maybe uh, something like that. Um, Tesla. A Tesla. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, great, great. Let's continue this metaphor because like what can be the worst case is, you know, if there isn't that kind of set of guidelines that the other people involved know about, but then every once in a while, the director's like, ah, I did, that, that, that idea is terrible. I, I, why would you bring that up? And the performers have no idea why. Um, and you know, that, that's really, really, I would imagine discouraging and, um, um, really difficult to handle. And so yeah, as a director, how do you, how do you put together helpful boundaries that people can work within, but then let them roam freely among those, um, make sense. Um, I want, I want to just dig into the, the very specific thing you mentioned, Stephen, um, and maybe if you could expand on it, the, that exercise of yes, no. And then not, you said not now, later, because. Um, could you expand on kind of what the purpose of that last part is? For sure. Um, so in developing a rehearsal plan for an ensemble, you sort of, you look at the skills that you're building in mm. and you need to learn what, and sort of what freedoms those skills earn you. And I mm. think also group bonding over time and what liberties that can earn you in terms of boundaries and communication, et cetera. Mm. Um, so for example, yeah, I did an improvised Tennessee Williams last yeah. year and we did get lots of big physicality, lots of intimacy in that, but that was at a certain point in the process, once that ensemble had bonded and talked a lot about boundaries and gotten to know each other, and we had an external intimacy person come and do yeah. that because uh, it's a great idea for the show, but in the first rehearsal, wow. it's a terrible idea because that mm. just time, for example. Yeah, no, that's really helpful um, in setting setting those expectations up front. You know, like here in both of your responses, you know, these setting of intentions. You know, for what what are we going to do 
in, in today's rehearsal in this course um, because there you know there's an infinite you know set of you know things we could cover what are we going to cover and, and why and what are we not going to cover and why um, makes a lot of sense um, interesting yeah same thing as in a very in a beginner's class if somebody shows up and they've read some books on improv and they want to cover something really specific and you're sort of two classes in talking about agreement and they're saying oh, could I please do a herald you have to say <laughs> great idea not today right yeah it's not the time for it yeah that makes a, a lot of sense and I can think of uh times when that's happened um and it's it's interesting like that one maybe comes more naturally to people. It's, it's, it's a very obvious thing to say, no, we're not gonna do a Herald in, in, in a one-on-one class, but um, you know, more, you know, bringing that same skill to maybe more delicate or more non-obvious situations uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So similarly, if people want to make more difficult choices about characters or relationships, it's the exact same thing. You need the skill to earn that. Like you can't, uh, so for example, I love when people play trans characters well yeah. and super into it. But in a 101 class, I just want you to do a basic good improv scene and yeah. that's not so no thank you. You're not gonna do a good job of that. That's just not. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean you can never do it in improv. That's yeah. Mm. yeah. One of I think one of the misconceptions that new improvisers have and even some old improvisers have as well is the idea that yes and means always say yes right and i think that's a really toxic misconception of yes and uh because like of course you want to say no you want to set your boundaries you want mm -hmm. to say yes but and qualify information when it is important that information is qualified and so i tell my students that perhaps philosophically uh, on like sort of an existential <laughs> abstract level, we are always saying yes to something in the fact that we are always accepting that we are in this moment. We're always working with what is in front of us. But when you say no to someone else, you well, first of all, you can say no to someone else. And the reason why is because when you say no to someone else, you're saying yes to yourself. You're saying yes to your values. And what I like about what Steven is talking about in terms of directing improv, you're saying yes to priorities right like mm. it's not a priority right now uh doing a herald in class two of a 101 <laughs> class is not a priority uh or doing a uh an improv scene that tackles a thematically rich but thematically difficult topic is yeah. not a priority right now because we're still learning how to do object work you know yeah 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 it's interesting that you know, some of those, some of those conversations and the way that we've just structured some of those responses um, comes really naturally in other contexts that don't hit on some of these more sensitive areas, right? If you tell somebody, you know, we're, we're learning the short form game, you know, genre replay, where you do a scene over and over in different genres, you know, the priority is to play the same scene in, uh, in, in different genres. And the priority is making big choices that can be easily seen over and over. It's not X, Y, and Z. And people have no, generally don't have a challenge understanding that concept. But when you say, you know, tackling, you know, difficult themes is not a priority right now. I, I, I tend to, to hear, you know, more resistance or more think piece style in Facebook comments or um, stuff like that. Um, and it's, I mean, I think that's part of the work of trying to work through these things is, you know, showing people that you can prioritize things, you can, you know, set requirements to build skills, to earn access to, to do these more difficult things uh, and just practicing those things. Like I love the idea of in early in a directing class, practicing saying yes or no. Similarly, you know, I'd rather have in a one-on-one -on -one class practicing how to say no, but not uh, negating, uh, and rather than um, trying to practice saying yes in a hard way, uh, right? I think that's a much more advanced skill uh, to, to try and do the mental gymnastics of, of that. Um, but we we often leave that for, well, we're just gonna to cover that in, in 401 uh, rather than, you know, rooting those good habits in from the first, you know, the first couple of classes, which I think is really feasible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've stopped 
sort of using the phrase yes and in improv classes. Oh, interesting. Oh, you might also have referred to this concept as yes and, uh, but I talked <laughs> about agreement. Yeah. And to me, it feels like uh, a healthier take on it because even just to do a warm up where you have to say yes and at the beginning of your sentence, you're training your brain to just automatically say yes. Mm. And I, I get that because a lot of people will automatically say no until they feel comfortable, but uh, it sets a dangerous precedent about uh, accepting uncomfortable situations. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So for example, one of my favorite things to do with beginners is have them do like a scene where they're doing the dishes together and they're flatmates and one of them likes cats better and the other one likes dogs better. Uh, just to illustrate really clearly, okay, we agree that we're flatmates and we're washing these dishes up. Mm -hmm. We don't agree about this thing that we're discussing. Mm. And that's fine because that's your opinion, right? Just to get that super clear. Yeah. yeah. I have definitely, throughout my teaching career, de-emphasized yes and a little bit but I still talk about it quite frequently like probably doesn't a class go by where like it doesn't make an appearance but especially in those earlier beginner classes thinking about different ways to recontextualize it so another way to think of yes and is what you just said is very important to me because blank right and what you just uh, and I'll literally have them do scenes back and forth where they're using this as a as an ad lib or sort of like as a structural guideline a training wheel improv scene where back and forth and you say what you just said is very important to me because and sort of have them realize that what you just said is very important to me is the yes and then because mm -hmm. is the and uh, or it's simply repeating what you heard the other person say or paraphrasing what you heard the other person say is a way of saying yes but like right from the get-go I try to uh, just because I know that there is that um that misconception around like what yes and is, and there's that like toxic culture of like, I need to accept any idea no matter what in order to be a team player. Uh, so I really try to like nip that in the butt right away. Oh, and there's also, this is a, this was a really great exercise that was taught by, um, her name is Chelsea Pace and, and she's a Maryland uh, theater artist who hmm. runs an organization called Theatrical Intimacy Education. And she takes the game Simon Says uh, which is predicated on saying yes, right? Simon mm. says do something and everyone must do what Simon says. Uh, and you, you play the normal version of that game, but then you do an adaptation of that game where you can say no, but you need to vocalize the no mm. and then ask for an adjustment uh, or oh. simply say that I would rather not do this round. And that is totally fine. And that sort of like teaches students at, at, at a beginner level that like, saying no and honoring your boundaries is is not only important but imperative i feel like i see a lot of particularly experienced improvisers uh sort of putting forth the idea that the scene should come first and that you should get over your own uh mm. issues with heavy air <laughs> to serve the scene um, so I feel like when I, when I teach stuff like that, I also make sure to say that I, even from a purely an artistic point of view, nobody wants to watch you be uncomfortable on stage. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody's enjoying that. You're not doing anyone any favors. Because I think there's, there's that instinct to soldier on and try to fix whatever's gone wrong, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's that, um, adage about needing to suffer for your art, uh, which I, I hate. I used to feel very strongly that that was true, that you did need to suffer for your art and sort of like trial by fire, realizing that, no, like I want my art to bring me joy and I want to feel comfortable. Well, maybe not always comfortable, but I want to feel nourished by it. And if I am challenged, okay. And if I have a cathartic moment, okay. But suffering, like that's, trauma right, right. Like that's 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 i want to inflict harm to myself right. for my art and i do not want to do that yeah i feel like i don't know if this is a thing in north america as well although i suspect it is uh, a lot of colleagues who've been to drama school 
what they're describing when they talk about their experiences there really just feels like they've paid lots of money to be traumatized. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in a way, having people show up to a beginner's class terrified because they've never had any drama training makes me really pleased because I don't have to deal with that baggage uh, in a way so we can model uh, healthy art from the start. Yeah, well, it's an, and it's amazing how, uh, how deep that must go, at least in, you know, Western cultures that I've experienced because I've had people, you know, say, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to try an improv class because of what I've heard from my friends and other people about the, the experience of being in theater. Um, and um, I mean, wow, how, how, how far reaching is that? That like, you know, we all kind of have this acceptance that that's how, that's how it goes. And we avoid this, amazingly rich and fun activity because of a concern that it's going to turn into that. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, obviously you can start to combat that by not doing it that way, but you know, that's That takes, you know, years and generations to undo, which is, uh, heavy. I, I also think the reverse is true from within the theater community, mm. at least the theater communities that I've been in contact with that uh, they are terrified of doing improv uh, because when they were in drama school, their teachers didn't really know how to do improv themselves or they just saw improv as a means to kind of like break students down or introduce mm -hmm. a competitive spirit or to get students comfortable overcoming their fear, which that part I think is important, but the, the way that improv has been taught to me most of the time in drama school has been in a way that uh, I could totally see it being traumatizing for other people. And, and I run into a lot of actors that are like, oh, I hate improv. Oh, I can't do improv. Wow. And I always, I, I internally chuckle a little bit, although I try to strike up a conversation as to why, uh, because I feel like all good actors are improvising uh, mm -hmm. even when you have a script in front of you so the definition of improv that I subscribe to is it's finding potential in whatever is readily available I think that's true of all styles of improv including like when you have a script in your hand because you're mm -hmm. trying to find potential in the text you're trying to find potential with your ensemble mates uh, and and to me like all good actors are improvisers and uh, an, an exquisite actor could like create a uh, could could just do long form improv and it, it'd be really compelling. But mm -hmm. I run into so many actors that uh, are are like terrified, and you know I literally like see the trauma like seep into their body the moment that improv is brought up. Mm -hmm. And I suspect it's because some theater teacher thought they knew how to teach improv, and instead they just put them in uncomfortable, challenging, and boundary crossing situations that uh, never went away mm -hmm. in their psyche. Yeah, I, I get similar stuff over here. And or people who went to drama school and are therefore convinced they're great in improv. But it feels mm. like the skill they've learned is finding something to be angry about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, like it feels like the skill of that is um, trying to achieve a big emotional outcome and just mm. add the to get there mm -hmm. sort of in a like vaguely misery way but huh. I, if you're used to doing scripted work and you know when this stuff is going to happen you can prepare yourself for it whereas if it's improv and then suddenly someone's just screaming at you it, that's a lot yeah I'm not into it yeah. yeah I think a lot of drama analysis centers on identifying the conflict and identifying your want in every single moment and while that is also important for improv, it is not something that you can sustain in every single moment. Sometimes you need to be, um, I think like a little wantless and mm. sort of just like be accepting or, or surprised or be in some other state of being other yeah. than the state of being of desiring an objective or uh, trying to elicit a conflict from, from your partner. Yeah. Uh, and I, that's unfortunate. Yeah. 
It's, what, Stephen? Yeah, go ahead. That's a much more polite way of putting it. <laughs> well, and it's interesting too, like, like scripted works tend to, you know, you know, not not universally, but try to make sure that every line and beat are progressing whatever's happening in, in this limited period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's not room for, you know, a lack of movement uh, or, or exploration, whereas uh, that's very much, you know, built into a lot of improv. And I'm sure there are people who try to achieve the scripted experience through improv and try and make sure that every line is working to, you know, to, to advance things, but that's not all improv. Um, and that style can lead to exactly what you describe where it's like, well, I have, I, I, oh, I've, I've learned to heighten. I must heighten a little bit every single line. And then, you know, 30 seconds later I'm screaming uh, or I've, I've, I've changed the game from something that actually happens in real life to, uh, you know, angels and demons are fighting about a cash register. Uh, and it's just not realistic. Um, and it's just another one of these, you know, kind of things that can, it can just run out of control um, if we, if we let it. So yeah, it's very instructive. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, that feels like a good kind of set point to, to pause at. Um, if there any, either of you have kind of any kind of burning thoughts or things that that's brought up that you want to kind of close with, happy to hear them. Otherwise, I'd um, love to hear what um, you're both working on, where we can find you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to do at the, at the end of these, uh, have everybody uh, name somebody they think is also doing good work in this space that uh, people should follow uh, or, or, or somebody to shout out, so. Um, we'll turn it over to, to, to for final thoughts and, and uh, plugs and uh, self plugs and non self plugs. I'll direct. I'll direct this time. Tavish, you go first this time. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess uh, final thoughts Ooh. is that improv is the most team oriented art form, and so it's dependent on cultivating respect mm. and advocating for boundaries, respecting boundaries. Uh, and of course, introducing anti-oppression and, and having like a social consciousness in, yeah. in the classroom or the rehearsal space. And you can learn more about me at birdcityimprov.com. Uh, my company's Bird City Improv. And I, there are new classes being posted uh, this week. Uh, that begin in March. All classes use a flex price system to pay what nice. you choose. Could be a full price ticket or even a free ticket because I believe that access to the arts uh, and access to community experiences should be a right and not a privilege. And so mm. anything we can do to increase access and decrease those barriers to entry. And someone that I would like to shout out uh, is Alicia Lee. Alicia mm. Lee is the head of the fine arts office in the Maryland State Department for Education. And she is also a Baltimore based improviser. She does so much amazing work with the yeah. community. She runs an organization called Sister Cities Girl Choir that gets uh, young women learning how to sing uh, and empowering uh, her communities and the communities yeah. of, the, of the young women that she's teaching. Uh, and she also brings an improvisational spirit with her into the classroom and is really big on instilling uh, and teaching other educators how to have a process-based mm. uh, uh, art process that's yeah. like redundant, a creative, a creative process that is reliable yeah. and also a creative process that is dependent on uh, equity. Wonderful. Thank you, Tavish. Yeah. Gorgeous. Um, Final thoughts, uh, boundaries and uh, structures around that are really important, yeah. not just to keep people safe, but because over time they can earn you quite a lot of permission. It's not just a no, it's a here's how we find yes. Mm. Um, and I think if, some, if you're not 100% sure somebody's comfortable saying no to you, you can't really trust their yes. Uh, so I think it's an important precursor, uh, even if you feel like we're probably all cool and on the same page, just to really check in on stuff yeah. like that. Um, you can find me on impromiscuous.com or Facebook slash Stephen Davidson Improv because they wouldn't let me have Impromiscuous down 30. But 
they let me call the page back. It's very yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I have uh, books and lots of talk classes coming up that are delightful. There are different payment options, including scholarships for all of those as well, of course. Wonderful. Um, someone you should follow, uh, specifically Monica Gaga, who mm. I teach a lot with about inclusion and other things. Uh, and a project that she's involved with is called uh, Different Women. Yeah. It's her Minder Asphalt, nods of agreement. Uh, but, Asphalt, but tell her home audience. <laughs> uh, and Ariane Barnes, who are doing a series of workshops for uh, specifically just for POC improvisers yeah. and more public facing things to report the findings of that. The education of all. Uh, and they're doing great work. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here and uh, for the wonderful conversation. I hope we can do it again sometime. And uh, I hope one day uh, we can all improvise on stage uh, in person together uh, once that's a, that's a thing. So um, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Until next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>